Hello and welcome. Please take a seat, get cosy and enjoy a cup of terror with me, Stephanie Valentine. Hello my spooky little pumpkins. How are you all? I hope you've been well. It is hot, bloody warm. Get ready for three months of me complaining about the heat. Like literally every video I make now for the next few months will include me complaining about the heat and going on and on and on. And oh, just warning you now, okay? Oh, also, if you hear any kind of bangs and clashing and whatever, um, there's a load of building work going on at the moment. Um, it's been going on for ages, so if you hear any random noises, it's those lot. Okay, so as I said, my name is Stephanie and this is A Cup of Terror, true crime videos with a dash of the strange. So this week we are going to be doing another historical witchcraft video and it's another very interesting and very angering case. Um, before I start though, I have to show you this. I have to, oh my god, I'm obsessed. <coughs> It's a little cow milk jug. Oh my God. I want to squeal every time I see this. Isn't it just like the best thing ever? I'm obsessed with cows. I love anything to do with cows. And I, oh, I just, I love cows. I want to cuddle a cow. <gasps> love it. So that's going to be, I'm going to be attempting to pour milk out of that later. <laughs> I'll just pop him there so you can see him. Oh, okay. Let's carry on before I get too distracted by the cute little cow. Okay, so it was early March, 1704. Today's case takes place in Pittenweem. Pittenweem is a small scenic fishing village in Fife on the east coast of Scotland. At this time in Scotland, the church was very powerful and the church leaders and ministers, they wielded a lot of power within the community and society as a whole. It is the location of a shameful incident that would result in the death of two innocent people and one who was banished from the community, cast out by the locals. 16-year-old Patrick Morton was the son of the village blacksmith and he was working in his father's forge. A local woman, Mrs Beatrice Lang, she came in and asked him to make some nails for her. He said that he couldn't make them straight away as he was busy working on something else. And there ended up being a bit of a to-do Beatrice, not happy about the situation, she stormed out of the forge, muttering under her breath. The next morning, Patrick found a bucket of water with some coal in it, and along with Beatrice's muttering, it led him to believe that she had cast a spell on him, that she had cursed him. Now, Patrick Morton was a very impressionable boy and also very superstitious, as many of them were. Believing he had been cursed, he soon lost his appetite and he became very weak and emaciated. Over the next few months, he suffered with fits and convulsions and became very hysterical. At one point, he claimed that the devil had appeared to him and urged him to deny the name of his saviour. Just before Patrick Morton had fallen ill, he had spoken to Patrick Cowper, who was the local minister. Now. Cowper was not a nice man. He hated witches and he was a horrible religious zealot. So Cowper had learned about what had happened on that fateful day at the forge. And you know, I just have this image of this disgusting man rubbing his hands with glee at the thought of, oh, torturing some innocent women and putting to death those evil witches. He fanned the flames of hysteria. He constantly went on about witches and the evil that they were capable of, that they had to get rid of them, and he incited the crazed mob behaviour that would result in a tragic, senseless killing. Obviously he had his own agenda and he soon convinced young Patrick Morton to come forward and accuse Beatrice Lang of witchcraft and bewitchment. Morton also accused a few of the other villagers of being her accomplices. Janet Cornfoot, Isabel Adam, Nicholas Lawson, Lily Wallace and Janet Horsborough. It is highly suspected that Cowper nudged Morton in the direction of those villagers. I like to think that he was kind of like, you know, like, hey, what about that Isabel Adam? Isabel Adam. I read 
thinking she's a witch. And oh, oh, what about that Janet Cornfoot? I think she's a witch too, you know. Maybe you can mention her. Mm -hmm. He was that kind of man, you know? Like, oh, I swear, those sort of people make my blood boil. You know he was influencing that young boy. So many of the women that Patrick Morton had named, they had kind of like links to witchcraft within the community or they were known for it. Beatrice Lang, she had a reputation as a witch. Janet Cornfoot, she quite liked to threaten anybody that she was arguing with, with spells. Um, Nicholas Lawson, a farmer's wife, she'd had some locals asking her for some advice about witchcraft. Janet Horsburgh was believed to be a witch as well. I mean, we don't know if any of them dabbled in things like herbal remedies, for example, or whether they were picked out as witches as a result of something as silly as their age or economic status. I mean, it could have been the consequence of a rumour, you know, someone saying something about someone else and that's it, you're forever associated with witchcraft. It's highly likely that Patrick Cowper, the minister, knew of these women and was probably outraged that they would continue to go about their lives without any sort of reprimand. And then when an opportunity came about to sort out those witches, he took it. I'll tell you, he's more a nice man. So the accused were imprisoned in the toll booth, the townhouse, and uh, they were tortured for their confessions, unfortunately. Oh, I'm gonna use the cow. Okay, are we ready? I'll try and pour this out without spilling it. Ah! Oh my god, I love, I love this. I think I'll use it every episode. <laughs> okay, don't get distracted, Steph. Don't get distracted. So, the women were viciously beaten. They were forcefully kept awake. They were pricked with needles and pins all over their body. So the usual kind of torture methods. And not surprisingly, many of them confessed. Beatrice Lang, she confessed to making spells, using buckets of water and burning coal, like the one that Patrick Morton had found. Um, she also confessed to stabbing needles into a wax model of her intended victim. She did retract this confession at a later date, though. Nicholas Adam, she confessed to ha having made a pact with the devil and also confessed to being intimate with him. Her confession ended up implicating another person, Thomas Brown, and he was charged with being a witch and also in prison, sadly. Now, Thomas Brown didn't confess to any of the allegations, but unfortunately for Thomas, he ended up starving to death in his cell. And, and this was actually quite a common occurrence for people locked up for, for witchcraft. They were treated badly and often many of the prison staff just wouldn't feed them. And, you know, being left in jail for, for long times, usually, they would end up slowly perishing. So, the women are being tortured, but there wasn't an, like, official witch trial happening at uh, Pitt and Weem. Um, Patrick Cowper, he had put in a request to the Privy Council in Edinburgh for the trial to be held in the village, but they turned it down, um, instead telling him that he had to have it in Edinburgh. So on August the 12th, all of the women except for Janet Cornfoot were released on bail. Isabel Adam, she was questioned by the Privy Council in October and she was freed. A month later, Beatrice Lang, Nicholas Lawson, Janet Horsburgh and Lily Wallace, they were all released after paying a fine of eight pounds. Beatrice Lang was sadly chased out of the village by the locals and she escaped to St Andrews in Scotland. But I couldn't find any information on the date of the death, um, but it said that she died soon afterwards and, and she died alone, most likely from the horrific torture that she had endured. Isabel Adam, well, unfortunately, nobody knows what happened to her. She too may have been cast out of the village for all that we know, but there's no record. And the same goes for Nicholas Lawson and Lily Wallace. Janet Horsburgh, however, she continued to live in Pittenweem. Now, we haven't reached the end of the sad events at Pitt and Weem, far from it. What about Janet Cornfoot? What happened to her? While all, the, all of the other women were, were released back in November, 
For some reason, Patrick Cowper, he left her in solitary confinement in the toll booth. However, she managed to escape. Her freedom wasn't long lived though, as on the 30th of January, 1705, she was soon captured by a mob of villagers. They tied her up, beat her. They dragged her by her ankles down to the harbour. Still tied up, she was swung from a rope that was tied to a ship in the harbour and the mob threw stones at her and she was frequently dunked into the freezing cold sea water. She was cut down and then a heavy wooden door was placed over her and the crowd proceeded to pile rocks on top of it until the weight of it crushed the life out of her body. This method of torture is known as pen forte et dur, strong and hard punishment. And it was a punishment originating in English law and it was used on um, those who refused to plead guilty or not guilty. And you may have heard about this punishment as there is a well-known example of this um, being used during the Salem witch trials. Only 13 years prior, Giles Corey was subjected to pressing to try and force him to plead. I'll try and do a proper video on him sometime, um, as well as the Salem witch trials, which I definitely want to do. Now, apparently this method of torture wasn't very common in Scotland, so maybe they got the idea from the Salem witch trials. Back to Janet. In a last act of disrespect, the mob got a man with a horse and cart to drive over her dead body multiple times to ensure that she was dead. It's just so disgusting. And then, to top it off, Janet was refused a Christian burial and her body was just thrown into, into a communal grave known as Witch's Corner. And just to rub salt into the wound, it, it eventually came out that Patrick Morton was a big, fat liar and a hysterical attention seeker. The mob were never punished, the borough authorities who gave their support were never punished, and that idiot, Patrick Cowper, he was never punished for his actions and his involvement in the torture. And members of the Cowper's um, family, they were actually involved in Janet Cornfoot's torture and murder. And, wow, well, Patrick Morton, the boy, well, of course he wasn't punished. <laughs> they never are, are they? Um, he was never brought to justice for, for his actions that resulted in the death of two people, well, three, really, if you count um, Beatrice Lang's death soon after her banishment, and the torment and torture of five others. I did read a really interesting fact. Allegedly, Sean Connery's ancestors were reportedly part of the lynch mob that um, you know, captured Janet and then tortured her. And if it's true, that's a rather horrible stain on your family's legacy. Now, this case like all the others, it's just so infuriating. You know, the persecution that these innocent women and men go through, it's just, it just angers me so much. Uh, but I really do enjoy doing these videos and researching them and telling you the stories of the innocent people accused of witchcraft because I feel like their stories need to be told. The stories of their lives and their fates need to be shared. And it's also really interesting exploring and learning about the, the various reasons why certain witch hunts and trials happened in the first place, you know, with factors such as religion, socio-economic issues, wealth and class, and good old fashioned misogyny being involved. <laughs> so that was today's case. The Pit and Weem witches who, spoiler alert, were not witches. Yeah, this one did make me very, very angry. I mean, Pat Patrick Morton, oh, having sod. But do you see how influenced he was that he fell ill with just the mere thought and suggestion of being cast? You know, some would say, oh, well, look, he actually fell ill. Surely it's true. But, you know, the mind is so powerful and it can alter your state and you can convince yourself of certain things. And I think that's what happened here. His own superstitions, you know, Patrick Cowper telling him all that nonsense. I think it all fully convinced him that he was cursed and then it all kind of manifested in his um, illnesses that he suffered. And as for Patrick, the other Patrick, oh, I know you shouldn't hate people, I kind of hate him. <laughs> I really want to call him rude names, 
but um, I shall refrain. But he's an effing jeffing pile of poop. That's the rudest I'm going to go. <laughs> I want to go worse, but I'll, I'll probably get told off. So that was today's case. What, what do you think? Do you think he was making it all up? Or was he genuinely bewitched by a witch? Like I said, uh, an extremely sad case. You know, poor Beatrice Lang being chased out of the village and then dying soon after all alone and probably in a lot of pain. Um, we don't know what happened to the other women. Poor Thomas Brown starving to death in prison. And then, oh, Janet. Janet Cornfoot. I mean, just the things that she endured and went through. Awful. Awful. So that is today's video and today's case. Thank you so much for joining me again today and thank you so much for your love and your support. It is just appreciated so much. So until next time, bye.